right, good evening. Stand, if you will, take your songbooks. Page number 45, Surely Goodness and Mercy. We're going to do all three verses of page number 45. Amen. All right, you can be seated tonight. We do greet you and welcome you to our evening worship service here at Parkwood Baptist Church. Let me make a few announcements, and and I'll move forward, uh, or we'll move forward into our service. Uh, remember, Wednesday night, Brother Kevin Vargas will be preaching, and so make sure you pray for him this week and are here to support him. Uh, Kevin will be preaching, not in my absence, I'll be here, but look forward to hearing Brother Kevin preach. Again, I mentioned it this morning, but I'll say it again, uh, the defense of my thesis, the oral defense, has been moved up to Tuesday, and so I trust you will pray for me. I appreciate that very much, if you would, and uh, this doctoral journey is almost over. It's almost over, and I expected a big hearty amen out of my wife right there, but she didn't say it out loud, but I promise you she meant it. All right, um, remember next Sunday at five o'clock, Christmas play practice, um, Again, I'm assuming that's for the kiddos. That's right. Kids. Oh, Christy said whoever wants to do it, so be careful. <laughs> and, uh, Christmas play practice, 5 o'clock. You got any questions, see, see Miss Christy about that. 
A uh, couple special guests coming in in the month of October, October the 8th, Sean Druitt will be singing in the evening service, and, uh, and so look forward to that. Sean will do an excellent job. He's a great singer. More than that, he's a, he's a great Christian. He, he loves the Lord, and he'll minister that evening. And then on October the 29th, uh, Dr. Tim Lee will be preaching. Uh, please invite some people to that, please. He is going to unapologetically preach the gospel very clear, very strong. Um, and uh, I assure you, if you've got lost family members, uh, they'll, you, you'll want them to hear Tim Lee preach. And uh, he's going to do an excellent job. He preaches all over this country in, in some of the largest churches in America. And so we're extremely fortunate and blessed that, to have him preach here at Parkwood on October the 29th. And so we'll look forward, look forward to that. All right. I don't know of any other announcements. Uh, good to have Miss Geneva, Miss Debbie's brother Ed here tonight. Let me uh, say this: you pray for him. His his wife passed away yesterday, and uh, and so so you pray for 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 Ed, Mr. Ed. He would certainly appreciate that. Tell him before the service. He said uh, he said, but I know that I'll see her again. And so so if you're a child of God, it's certainly death is not not the end. Death is really the beginning of eternity, and, and uh, it's a comfort to know that certainly we can see our loved ones again if they know Christ, and we do as well, and so that's a blessing. Appreciate him being here tonight, and I trust, trust you'll pray for him as I will. All right, we've got two specials tonight. I believe the youngins are going to come sing a song for us tonight, so, uh, so Miss Christy, you and your crew, y'all come on at this time and sing for us. I'm just glad I don't have a special letter. So, <laughs> Mark gets to follow that. 
All right, page number 43, stand with me if you will. We're going to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness. We'll do all three verses of page number 43. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness. Lord unto me. Summer and winter and springtime and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy, and love. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Pardon for sin that endureth thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow blessings all mine with ten thousand beside great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Thank you for the good singing. You can be seated. Brother Mark has our special tonight. Good pick. Over in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, the Word of God tells us that obedience is better than sacrifice. And uh, I love them songs that the kids sang. Can't top that. But I can sing a song that kind of goes along with that. Amen. This song is called Lord, Here Am I. It was uh, sung for many years by Carol Robertson years ago. And I discovered it over the last couple of years, and I think I've sang it over in the school once before, but I love this song. I hope it'll be a blessing to us tonight.
only direct me and I'll find my way teach me the mission appointed for me what is my labor and where it shall Thank you, Mark. Two good specials tonight. And Mark, I'm sorry you're not as cute as they were. <laughs> but you did a great job. I, you know, you did a great job. So I won't knock that. But but uh, two good specials, great songs. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. I invite you to open your Bibles to Romans chapter two. Romans chapter number two. And we'll continue in our series in the book of Romans tonight. It's probably not a shock to you that I am not a huge fan of uh, easy believism. I'm not a huge fan um, of a lot of mega ministries, and I rarely do this, but for example, I'll use one by name. I'm not a huge fan of the ministry of Joel Olstein. Um, it's not because of his pearly white smile. I'm not anti-smile. <laughs> and it's not because of his ultra-positive personality and, and the fact that he wants people you know, to know about the blessings of God for God's people. I am I'm not against being positive. I'm not against people being blessed at all. But what makes his message and others like him, their consistent message so deceptively dangerous, is that he refuses to acknowledge and teach the whole truth. What I mean by that is he doesn't make obvious the good news of God in that it confronts the bad news of mankind. Uh, I've said this over and over again the past few weeks. If all you have is good news, you, you really don't have good news. You just have news. Because what makes the good news so good is when you compare it and you contrast it to bad news. Bad news is the black velvet backdrop of good news. For example, here's a quote by... Mr. Osteen, that kind of gets to the heart of what I mean. I quote, he said this, In dealing with people for several years, thousands of people, one thing I can tell you for sure is that 99.9% .9 of people are not bad people. They make poor choices, but deep down they've got a great heart. Now, I want to believe that. 
I, I want to believe that, don't you? I, I really do. I mean that. I, in fact, if I, didn't, if I didn't believe the Bible, I would believe that. The only problem with that is it's not true. And the reason it's not true isn't because I don't agree with it. Uh, just FYI, what, what I think and what I believe is irrelevant. It's not true because of me. I'll tell you why it's not true. It's not true because God. Because God, who is the standard of truth, who is the declarer of truth, in his word, which is truth, says it's not true. Here's what God says about people. Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Romans chapter 3, verse 10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeks after God. They're all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable, and there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Sound anything like the quote I just read you? Matter of fact, it's the very opposite of what I just read you. Read you. Joel and others believe 99.9% .9 of people have a good heart. God says, no, 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 100% of people have a corrupt heart, a wicked heart. The question is not which do you prefer. The question is ultimately, what do you believe? Who are you going to believe? And it is an unfortunate thing that thousands, perhaps even millions, uh, believe those types of ministries and not God. Don't get me wrong, this is not exposing Joel Olstein Sunday. We'll, we'll save that for another occasion. <laughs> Here's my point for you and I this evening. If we truly believe that the vast majority of people are, are good, intrinsically good, then we need to only teach and preach on things that, that uh, makes us feel good and brings good because eventually that good message is going to connect with the good of the human heart and bam, Good things will happen, and more importantly, God things will happen. But, on the other hand, if that is the correct model, and that is the correct way to preach and teach the Bible, then I'll tell you what you all do. You all take your page in Romans chapter number 2 and rip it out, because it doesn't belong. We would have to throw out the majority, if not all, of the book of Romans, because I'll be honest with you, the book of Romans is not overflowing with an abundancy of, of feel-good verses about the state of humanity. Matter of fact, it's probably the opposite of that. I just read you one in chapter 3 that the Bible says there is none good. No, not one. If you've not been with us in our study over the past eight weeks in the book of Romans, let me try to quickly catch us up where we are. We're going to break this message tonight into two, part one and part two for the sake of time, but uh, the message, the, the book of Romans, this letter, is written, of course, by the Apostle Paul to the church in Rome. Of course, you know the, the story by now, the, there, there had been a crisis that had arisen between Jews and Gentiles, and it caused division, it caused disunity in the church. And Paul writes him a letter. Now, Paul had not been to this church. He had not been to Rome uh, yet. He had not met the Christians that comprised the church just yet, and he wants to write a letter of instruction, a letter of exhortation, a letter of, of encouragement that will lead them through their difficulties, their problems, until he is able to hopefully be with them in person. But in the meantime, what in the world could he write that, that, that would bring help to these issues, light to these issues, and, and heal the, the strife, and heal the rift that was threatening to split the church and ultimately bring reproach to the name of Christ uh, in the all-important city of Rome. Well, I find it interesting that Paul does not write a letter emphasizing staying positive and trusting in the good-heartedness of, man, of mankind, the innate goodness of man. He doesn't, he doesn't mention that one time. He doesn't even point out who's right and who's wrong and tell them how they need to proceed forth uh, you know, with the, the problems they're facing. As a matter of fact, he's going to write a letter, and it's going to have a singular focus, and it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, why is that? I think personally, Paul focuses on the gospel because he doesn't know who in the church is truly saved and who in the church is truly lost. He doesn't know who is living in the power of the Holy Spirit and who's not. He doesn't know who understands all of the ins and outs, the 
intricacies of the gospel and who doesn't. And friend, really most of the problems in the church are not behavioral issues. When it boils down to it, most of the problems in the church, including ours, are belief issues. And over time, wrong belief will lead to wrong behavior. You might hide it for a while, but you won't hide it forever. And the outward behaviors of these in the Roman church show that their inward beliefs had to be addressed. And so Paul begins to pen this letter. He writes this letter, and when he does, he takes dead aim on this church understanding the gospel. And essentially what he's saying is, if you really understand the gospel, I mean really understand the ins and outs, the intricacies, all that the gospel is, then, then you're not going to have these issues with loving one another. And if you really get the gospel and understand the gospel, then, then accepting one another will not be a problem. Listen to what I'm about to say because I want to be very pastoral here for a moment. Church unity. Unity in the body of Christ at Parkwood Baptist Church depends on gospel clarity. Did you hear what I said? Church unity depends upon gospel clarity. Your understanding, my understanding of the gospel will enhance and strengthen the unity in this place. I think the thesis of this book is chapter, is chapter 1, verse 16. Paul writes, and he says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The word gospel means good news. This letter details the good news of God for the salvation of the world. And, and, and here's what's crazy. When I read chapter number one, or, or when I get started in chapter one, I realize the context that Paul's writing. Uh, I would think, you would think, that Paul would immediately launch into explaining why this good news is so good and why you ought to receive this good news, but he doesn't do that at all. As a matter of fact, he spends the rest of chapter one, all of chapter two, and uh, at least half, maybe more than half of chapter number three, talking extensively about the lostness of mankind and, and the sin of mankind and the wrath of God on that sin and the judgment of God on that sin. Why? Because if you're going to receive the right cure, then you've got to have the right diagnosis. One writer said, before a map can tell you the direction you want to go, you've got to know the location of where you're at. Friend, the good news of God only becomes good news when you understand why you desperately need good news. And that is because of the bad news. You see, with every good gospel presentation, every good gospel witness, every good uh, soul winner who presents the gospel, there is a definite order to that. First comes the warning of danger, then comes the way of escape. First comes the, the message of condemnation, then comes the offer of God's forgiveness. First comes the bad news of guilt, then comes the good news of the gospel of grace. And the whole message and the whole purpose of the loving and the redeeming grace of God that is offered to you and I through the Lord Jesus Christ, it rests upon the reality of mankind's universal guilt of rejecting and abandoning God. And because of it, universally, mankind is under his sentence of eternal condemnation, eternal judgment, eternal death. And the Apostle Paul hears about the problems that are going on in the church of Rome. He knows that people who refuse to believe they are lost will never surrender their life to the heavenly rescuer who came to find them. And he understands that while he could tell them about the good news immediately, the beauty of the good news has to be held in contrast to the severity of the bad news. Chapter number one ends with Paul declaring that God's wrath, that is, that his judgment is upon unrepentant sinners everywhere. And we read that in verses 28 through 32, and he gives that long list of specific sins. And now Paul is like any good lawyer. He anticipates what his audience, what his hearers might think, what they might say in response to what he's just written. Paul imagines as this letter is being read in, in the church at Rome that day, 
uh, that, that there are going to be those when they hear chapter 1, verses 28 through 32, they're going to stand to their feet. They're going to clap their hand. They're going to fist pump. They're going to say a hearty amen. They're going to say, you're right, Paul. Oh, boy, you nailed it, Paul. Those dirty, rotten sinners, they do deserve the wrath of God. Get them, Paul. Sick them, Paul. They, they deserve the judgment of God. About time somebody got on them, Paul. They're the problem in this sick world. It ain't us. It's them. Get them. Way to go, Brother Paul. Give it to them. Now, Paul, watch how quickly Paul's going to turn the table. In chapter number one, this is interesting. You ought to mark this. Uh, this will help you understand the book of Romans. In chapter number one, Paul is consistently using the pronouns they. Verse 28, verse 29, verse 31, they, they, they. And again, he's anticipating that response. You're right, Paul, it's them. It's not us, it's them. But you notice in chapter number two what he starts with? Therefore thou, you, you. The, the, the global warning of God's wrath and his judgment on sin and on sinners. In chapter number one, it's global, it's universal. Now it's very personal, it's individual in chapter number two. In chapter number one, Paul says that the judgment of God awaits all of those obvious sinners in the world, those that, that fit in those categories in verses 28 through 32. Now, chapter number two, Paul says, but wait a minute before you get real excited about hearing that. Wait just one second. Now the judgment of God awaits the not-so-obvious sinners in the church as well. Those who hide under a cloak of outward religiosity, outward moralism. And yet on the inside, they're just as rotten as anyone else. He's uncovering and he's exposing a major problem in the church of Rome that day, and I'm sure a major problem in the church today, and that is the problem of hypocrisy. Uh, Christian author Brenham Manning said this. Uh, he said the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. Now, that's a, that's a strong statement. Uh, that's a head-scratcher for me. I, I I need to think about that, but, but he says, I quote him, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. And I agree with this part. Those who acknowledge Jesus with their lips walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That's what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Unrepentant hypocrites in the church are those who will publicly condemn the sins of others while at the same time participating in those same sins privately. Hypocrites have somehow convinced themselves that they are immune to the consequences of not truly surrendering to the Lordship of Christ and living lives obedient to the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, to the Word of God. They're shouting for him at the end of chapter number one, Amen, Paul, you got it. And now in chapter number two, he shocks them. He says, God loves you, but you need to understand it's not just those in chapter number one that he's ready to judge. Oh, he's ready to judge you too. And notice what he says. And with that in mind, let's get into the text in chapter number two. Romans chapter two. Let's read 16 verses tonight. We're going to break this down into two messages just because of, uh, first of all, the length of the text. There's so much here. And number two, the, the depth of, of the doctrine here. Notice in verse number one, Romans chapter two, verse one. The Bible says, therefore, thou, again, personal, you, you, you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou that judges doest the same thing. We are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things, and thinkst thou this, O man? that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Notice in verse number 4. He's talking to another one. Perhaps you didn't fit in the category of verse 2 and 3. Perhaps you're in verse number 4. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness... An impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath 
and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and who do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also the Gentile, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, for there is no respect of persons with God. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, for as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. But when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. Stop our reading there tonight. Two points tonight. The first two of four. Paul's going to make four very clear statements about the judgment of God on people. Number one, it is indisputable. Verse number one, go back, he says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself, for thou judgest, doest, you do the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Sounds familiar to language we heard back in chapter number one, verse 20, about people being without excuse. Chapter 1, verse 20, notice the Bible says, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Chapter number 1, what Paul is saying is even if no one's told someone about God, people know because God has made himself known. And uh, Paul uses the, the example of creation. Chapter number 2, he's talking about religious hypocrites, those will also have no excuse before God on Judgment Day. And it's because they showed not only did they know that there was a God, uh, they knew right from wrong when they condemned others for their sinful actions, yet secretly they were at the same time doing the exact same things. At, at first glance, Paul's his blanket indictment that some of them do the same sinful things that he just listed in chapter number one, it's almost an easy thing to dismiss if we just keep reading. But, but let's be honest for a moment. Most all of us, we, we've got, and, and I thought about this this week, we, we've got really three moral categories uh, in which we place people. Uh, we've got those that they're just bad, undeniably bad. And we'll, we'll think about people like Adolf Hitler, um, uh, Judas Iscariot maybe, um, Charles Manson, those that everybody agrees, they're just wicked. We put them in that category of just bad. They're bad people. But then you've got those that are good, undeniably good. The name that comes to my mind is Billy Graham. Uh, you, you might say Mother Teresa, others. Usually when we talk about good people, they're the examples. Those are the people that come to our mind. Then you've got that middle category, those that we're still... Still waiting to see. Somewhat good, yet sometimes bad, yet to be determined what category we're going to put them in. And probably, probably that's where we put ourselves in, in, in that category. We, we typically put each other in that category. We kind of rank people in this category based on observable goodness. They're pretty good folks. We're going to put them in this category. I've seen them make some mistakes, so we're going to put them in this category. But the only problem is, is when we, when we do that, who, who do you suppose is the, is the measuring rod as to where people rank in our categories? Well, we are, ourselves. In my life, Wesley is the standard. 
In your life, you are the standard. For example, I'll get out on the freeway. And those who go slower than me, oh, they're, they're, they're jerks, idiots. <laughs> those who drive faster than me, well, they're clearly a menace to society and the safety of my children. <laughs> you ask the random person about whether or not they're going to go to heaven or hell one day, you may hear an answer like this. Well, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than so-and-so. I must be pretty good. And so, therefore, again, I'm the measuring rod. I'm the, the measuring stick. We, find, we tend to find a way to compare ourselves to others who, who really don't measure up to our standard of good to make ourselves feel better about ourselves. You know that in, in, in prison, they say that murderers... And uh, hardened criminals, they, they, they have no tolerance for, for child molesters and they have no problem with mistreating them, potentially even killing them. Why? Because when they, doesn't matter what, what they've done, when, but when they compare themselves to that, they feel superior. We, we all say we want justice in the world, but the truth is, is that we all carry a standard of righteousness that's only based upon our own perceived goodness. What I mean by that is, oh, I will tolerate only as much evil in the world as I can personally accept. But yet when I feel that people are worse and more sinful than I perceive myself to be, that's when I get annoyed and that's when I demand justice to, to, to be done. Well, uh, then we get upset that God doesn't remove all the evil in the world. And yet when I get upset that God doesn't remove evil in this world, I tend to forget that if he removes all the evil in this world, that would require him to remove me as well. What I really mean is, Lord, get rid of all the evil in the world that's worse than what I think is me. But here Paul says God's judgment of us isn't like our judgment of us. Our standard of judging uh, other people is ourselves. Paul says that God's standard for judging is truth. Do you see that in verse number 2? He uses the word truth. In essence, here's what he says. He says, now, now, now we know that the judgment of God, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, against those who do all of these things, that that judgment is based on truth. Truth is not a principle. Truth is a person. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When it comes to final judgment of people, everyone's going to be compared and compared to and measured up according to the truth. And that is Jesus Christ. And by the way, there's no one that comes close to the standard. No one. That's why Paul's going to get, when we get to chapter number three, he's going to say this, that all have sinned. And all have fallen short of the glory of God, that standard of perfection. Everybody, and I mean everybody, will be held to the same standard on judgment day. And that is the perfection of Jesus Christ. And it is an undisputable fact that we all, every one of us, fall short in that comparison. But what religious hypocrites have done is they have convinced themselves that they don't fall as short as many others. And so somehow God's going to cut them a break. Let me, let me ask you a question. So I was reading, I, I found this illustration to illustrate this truth, and I thought it was, was good. It helped me understand it anyways. Suppose all of us take a trip to the Grand Canyon, and we're standing at the edge of the Grand Canyon, and all of a sudden a an active shooter comes, and he's got a gun held to our head, and he said, you've got to leap to the other side, or I'm going to pull the trigger. Would it matter that some of us can jump, you know, can brawl jump 10 feet, and others can only brawl jump 5 feet, or 2 feet, or 3 feet? No, it wouldn't matter at all, because the result's going to be the same. Death for all of us. 
And that's the point that Paul is trying to make here, that the judgment of God is going to fall upon every single person. And the standard by which all of us are going to be compared to is the same, and that is the perfection of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't matter how much better I think I am than so-and-so, or you think you are than so-and-so. You fall way short. I fall way short. That is an indisputable, undeniable fact. The judgment of God is indisputable. Secondly, the judgment of God is inescapable. You won't get away from it. Notice in verse number 3, let's read verse 3 and 4, it says, And thinkest thou this, O man? He's asking a question here. It's almost rhetorical, if you will, in a way. He says, O man, he's asking a question, O man that judgest them which do such things and doest the same. Again, he's talking to those hypocrites. Those, you, you're, you're judging somebody for what they've done, but you're doing the exact same thing behind closed doors. Notice this. Let me start over. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that it's the goodness of God that leads thee to repentance? Now, I want you to pay attention for the remainder of our service to a word found two times in verse number four. It's the word goodness. The word goodness. Kindness is a good, good synonym there, good translation there. Goodness, kindness. It, it, it's not that God is good as opposed to bad. It's that he is good in the sense of being really benevolent really kind toward people who just don't deserve it, which, of course, would include you and I. In the Old Testament, there is a, there, there is a Hebrew word that's pretty close to this word, uh, goodness, and it's the Hebrew word hesed. You see it translated in your Old Testament as loving kindness. Uh, God possesses an innate kindness, a, a natural generosity, mercy, compassion, Patience, a love for sinners. That's the goodness of God. The goodness of God, the kindness of God demonstrated in his hesed, his loving kindness toward us is one of the reasons we're encouraged in the Bible to worship God. As a matter of fact, Psalms 23, 6, uh, we sang it tonight, by the way. Uh, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Psalms 107 verse 8 says to give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Uh, he's good. You, you cannot worship God if you leave out his goodness, if you leave out his benevolence, if you leave out his mercy, his kindness, his love. It, it's the goodness of God. Paul says, uh, referring back to verse number 4, the kindness of God uh, that leads to repentance. But don't miss this. Notice what surrounds this incredible truth. And by the way, that is an incredible truth, that it's the goodness of God, the fact that God is so good to his children, to, to sinners who deserve judgment, who deserve justice. He's so good to them that it leads them to repentance. That's incredible. But notice this. Don't miss this. Notice what surrounds this. All around this good news is terrible news. It's bad news. All around this wonderful truth is this warning of the judgment of God. There are people inside the church, outside the church, who constantly, constantly balk at the idea of a loving God who showers incredible blessings on people day after day after day, but yet will one day run out of patience and will judge and punish those who refuse to turn from their sin, who refuse to trust in Christ as their Savior. They balk at that idea. But that's exactly what Paul is saying. He says, you are taking for granted the goodness of God. You are abusing the kindness, the, the goodness of God, not realizing that God being good to you, benevolent to you, merciful to you, it's intended not to make you feel better about your life, it's intended not to, make you, not to make you think every day is a Friday, but to bring you to your knees in repentance. 
And it's this goodness of God. There's two components to it. Notice, the first one is forbearance. It, it, it is a tolerance. It's almost like a truce. It's the absence of hostility momentarily. Because of his goodness, because of his grace, his mercy, his kindness, God is holding back his anger. And because of his goodness, he is still blessing undeserving people. But then there's another aspect to it, and that is his patience, his long-suffering. Oh, he's good. He's kind. He's merciful. He's benevolent. He's loving with sinners for a long, 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 long time. He holds back his wrath, his hostility, a long time. If all God was was justice, listen to what I'm about to say. If all that God was was justice, he would have long ago taken his hand and wiped this world clean. He did it one time in the flood. But he didn't do it before hundreds of years and 120 years of a gospel preacher of righteousness named Noah warning people about their sin. God is by nature good to sinners. It's called grace. It's what makes the sun shine and the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. He has tolerance. That is, he withholds justice that you deserve, that I deserve, and he does it for a long period of time. Matter of fact, Nehemiah 9.17 says this about God, that he is ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. And I find it interesting every time a major catastrophe hits and people are hurt, people die, you're going to hear the question every single time. You're going to hear this question, well, why did God allow this to happen? Perhaps you've asked the question. If God is so loving and so, and so merciful and so, so good and so kind and so grace-filled, then why in the world would he let this happen? And they see this, this event like this cataclysmic judgment of God from time to time, and they conclude that that has to mean that God is mean, that God is harsh, that God has no mercy, that God has no kindness. And they say it's proof positive that he allowed this event to take place. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The truth is, listen to me, the truth is, and I, and I don't want to be harsh tonight, please don't take it that way, but the truth is, is that all the sinners who, who have perished in disasters, let's just be honest, they should have perished long before. The wages of sin is death. You ought to be dead, I ought to be dead after one sin. According to the Bible, friend, the, the fact that any of, any of us live beyond the first time we sin, that in, in, in and of itself is an extension of God's mercy and his grace and his kindness and his goodness. God has every reason to take his hand and wipe you and I out of here. He has every reason to, every reason to wipe out the whole human race, but his goodness, his forbearance, his patience. It causes him to bring blessings into the lives of sinners and, and to withhold judgment for the purpose of bringing sinners to himself through repentance of sin and faith in Jesus Christ. The problem is, though, is that sinners get used to his goodness. We get comfortable with kindness and we get comfortable with, with grace and, and all they can see is something that appears to be an unjust act because we're so used to his goodness and and we'll say, well, that act was just way too severe. God is mean and he's harsh and he's cruel. And the reason we feel God is cruel and unjust is because we don't understand how wicked we really are and how sinful we really are. And we're unwilling to come to the place, the provision that he has made to rescue us from his justice and bring us into eternal bliss, namely the grace of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Sin produces death instantaneous death as a matter of fact god told adam in the day that you eat you shall die every moment that you live after your first sin is grace every moment every breath you take after your first sin is kindness and goodness can i remind us tonight that god doesn't owe us anything nothing he doesn't owe us life 
And sin brings death, and death could come at any moment, but God gives life freely to man for the purpose of showing his kindness in the face of our rebellion. And he has every right at any moment to take life from anyone, but yet God is so kind, and God is so good, and God is so merciful that he has sent his son into the world to take the punishment that was yours, that should have been mine, and he'll save anyone who will believe. He is patient, but he's provided much more than just patience. He has provided a sacrifice in our place. We're so used to mercy. We're so used to goodness. We're so used to sinning and getting away with it. We're so used to iniquities without instant punishment we're so used to it we're so accustomed to abusing the grace of God and the goodness of God that when that when justice does appear we think it's injustice that we get offended if God is not merciful because we're so used to his mercy it's because truly we don't have any idea we don't understand at all what we truly deserve there are times when God's mercy will run out as a matter of fact God said my spirit will not always strive with man. He said, I'm not going to do this forever. Again, going back to Noah's day, he gave him 120 years of faithful preaching of righteousness, and then he brought the flood. Paul says, yes, God is loving, and oh yeah, God is kind. You better believe he's gracious, gracious and patient, but, but when you accept and you live in the goodness of God without obeying and serving and acknowledging and surrendering to God, then what you do, you're, you're showing that you are abusing the grace of God. You, you show contempt for his goodness. You mock it. You despise it. You make light of it. Paul says that understanding, that attitude shows you have no understanding whatsoever of the goodness of God, that it has a purpose. And that purpose, purpose is not, not for you to get used to it. That purpose is to lead you to repentance, to lead you to Jesus. Let me close with this. Uh, hold your spot here. I may come back, but go to Luke chapter 13. Go to Luke chapter 13. I'll close with this. I want to I show you this. There are two events in Luke chapter 13. These would have been front page newspaper events. If, if you would have been alive in the days of Luke chapter 13, you would have seen these on the front page of the Jerusalem Chronicle. Notice in Luke chapter 13... Notice in verse number 1, the Bible says there were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, that's Jesus, told Jesus of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Now stop there for a moment. And so what you've got in Luke 13, you've got some people in the crowd and they're bringing this, this news to Jesus, this report to Jesus that there had been some Galileans who had been killed by Pilate and their blood mixed with their sacrifices. Well, Galileans, that's Jews from the north. They had come to Jerusalem, and they were there to offer their sacrifices in, in the temple. And while worshiping God, Pilate's soldiers, evidently, they came in and sliced them to death. And so the question was, why did this happen? How can Jesus explain this tragedy to us? And notice in verse 2, Jesus answered and said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all other Galileans? Because they suffered such things. That's, again, Jesus is responding to their question with a question, and it's almost a rhetorical question. What he's saying is, do you think these people died because they were worse than everybody else? Let's make that practical. Do you think people that die in a, a tornado or a flood or whatever you know, disaster you can think of, do you think they're worse than those who survived it? Let's go back just a couple of years ago. Our world changed with COVID-19. Jesus might say, do you think those who, who passed of COVID-19 were worse people than those who got it and didn't die? Is that, is that what we're saying here? The people who are alive are better than the ones that, that passed? That, uh, let's talk about cancer. Those that get cancer, are they, are they worse people than those who get cancer and survive? That's what he's asking and notice in verse number 3, he says, no, I tell you nay. No, you're thinking wrong. 
but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. That's a powerful statement. What he says is, what are you talking about them for? You need to understand you're going to die too. The only problem is you don't know when. You've got to be ready, and you've got to be ready right now. How? Well, you better repent. That's what he said. Except you repent. If not, he says you're going to die a sad death. You're going to suffer a miserable eternity in a devil's hell. You're living on borrowed time, friend. You and I are living under mercy, extended kindness, the goodness from a holy God, and he cannot tolerate sin, but thank God he tolerates sinners for a limited time. And his willingness to wait on you and even bless you until your repentance, boy, that is an act of incredible kindness and goodness. Now, immediately following that in Luke chapter 13, Jesus is going to bring up another current event that would have certainly been known all over Jerusalem, would have been on the front page of the newspaper. Notice in verse 4, on that same subject, are those 18 upon whom the tower of Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? Or that, that, I guess there were sinners because they happened to be trapped under the tower when the tower fell and they died. He's asking if those who were killed in that accident were worse than those who survived. Is that why they died? Because they were worse sinners. And again, Jesus says in verse 5, I tell you, no. But except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Again, whenever there's a disaster, whenever there's a, a tragedy and an unexplainable death of any degree, the message is always the same. You're going to join them. You're going to die too. And Jesus says, wake up, get ready, repent. You live, I live, all of us live under the extension of the goodness of God. And that goodness is meant to lead us to repentance. But unfortunately, we, we often allow it to lead us to entitlement. And when we seek the justice of God, when we, when we seek after it, and when we see the justice of God enacted, we're so blind to it many times, and we'll, because we're so used to grace, we say, that's injustice. It ain't right. And yet we need to understand that while God may not bring his wrath immediately, he's going to bring it ultimately. His judgment is inescapable. There is only one hope, and there is only one way of escape, and that is Jesus Christ. That is the gospel. That is the cross. You ought to embrace your Savior who died in your place. God offers forgiveness of your sin. He wipes the slate clean. And the Bible says he remembers your sins no more. That's good news. I was reading a psalm yesterday, the day before, and I jotted it down. I thought, I need to close with that. Listen to Psalms 86.5. For thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight. I don't know the state of your heart, the state of your soul. But if you're lost tonight, can I encourage you, call upon the Lord. Seek him, ask him to forgive you through the provision of Christ at the cross of Calvary. And then when you say yes to him, then thank him for his goodness. Because I promise you, he owes you absolutely nothing. Everything he's given you and I is nothing but the goodness of God, the kindness of God, the blessings of God. He owes you nothing, but you owe him everything. You owed a debt that you could not pay. He paid a debt that he did not owe. That's goodness. Father, I bow in your presence, thanking, thankful for the goodness of God. Lord, certainly when we see it against the badness of mankind and our sinfulness and our wickedness, but our hearts are ever more grateful for the grace of Jesus. We realize just how good you are to us. 
Father, ultimately that was seen in the fact that you gave your darling son to die on Calvary's cross. To make a way when we couldn't make a way. For our sins to be forgiven, for our souls to be saved. For eternity to be dealt with. So that we can spend it with you. And I pray that if there's someone under the sound of my voice tonight that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that has not accepted your goodness, that hasn't allowed the goodness of God to lead them to repentance, Lord, I pray they do that even tonight. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Brother Ken, you got a number for us?